Hey, today we're going to be talking about building buildings and we're here at the Memphis Airport with the project that Mark Enoch is helping with and specifically we're going to be talking about the parable of the two builders and you probably know this parable, you're familiar with it and we all know the song so Mark is also a good singer so he's going to help me sing it. All right, here we go. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock, and the rains came a tumbling down. Oh, the rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up, and the house on the rock stood firm. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand, and the rains came a tumbling down. Oh, the rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up, and the house on the sand went flat. So build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. Build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. Build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessings will come down. Oh, the blessings come down as the prayers go up. The blessings come down as the prayers go up. The blessings come down as the prayers go up. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's good. That's good. So yeah, we're here. We're we'll talking about. We do that a the, lot on construction sites. Do you just we, break out in song? Yeah. That's good to know. So uh, yeah, we're here. Mark is going to be our resident expert on on building. He's going to help us understand this parable of Jesus. And technically, I guess Mark is a uh, you're a uh, structural engineer. Structural engineer. That's exactly what I was going to say. And what that means for all you people out there who don't really understand the building trade, uh, Mark is out here at this construction site every day. He's got his hard hat on, his vest, he's got tool belt, and he's out here. You can catch him out here any day. He's hammering, he's sawing, he's running the the backhoe and the the bulldozer, and he's digging, he's pouring concrete. Actually. He's, Actually, I don't do any of that stuff. I uh, sit at a desk behind a computer and I design buildings. You told me you're a building expert. That's why I have you out here to help us understand the building process that Jesus is talking about in the parable of the wise and the foolish builder. And now you tell me you don't even come out here. You sit behind a desk at a computer. That's right. Well, at least, okay, can you just at least read the parable, okay? Right. Can you read? Sure. All right. Sure, I can read. Let's read that. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and, and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. That was a good job reading that. I'm sure that helps with your job security since you set a computer all day and look at the computer screen all day. I'm sure reading comes in handy, but good job. So... Yeah, so I thought we'd just get straight into the interpretation of this parable. And it's really common knowledge that when you build a building, you got to dig your foundation deep. you got to go all the way down to bedrock. Otherwise, your building is going to be unstable, and it's going to be leaning one way or the other, and it could just fall apart, you know. So Actually, it, actually that's not true either. Uh, we build all the time and without getting to bedrock. Here in Memphis... There's not a single building in Memphis that's bearing on bedrock. The bedrock in Memphis is about half a mile to a mile deep. So that's far too deep for us to dig down to bedrock for every building. So in Memphis, all of the buildings either bear on clay or on sand. 
um, the majority of them bear on clay. Even the tall buildings in downtown just bear on clay. Uh, at St. Jude, we designed a building from, uh, from the top of the roof to the bottom of the basement is over 200 feet, and it actually bears on a layer of sand. So as long as the sand is well consolidated and confined, it is fine to bear on sand. There won't be any problems. I don't know, what are you doing? I mean, I had this, everybody knows what this parable is about and you are deconstructing it. You're supposed to be in construction, not deconstructing. What are you talking about? Sorry, I'm a structural engineer. This is what we do. The problem is, is that in Memphis, things are different than they are in, uh, in Palestine. In the days of the Bible, when this was written in Palestine, you had sandy areas a lot of those sandy areas were seasonal uh, flooded, seasonally flooded. When the rains would come, they would flood those areas. Uh, Palestine and London both get about 22 inches of rain a year. But in London, you have 300 rainy days a year. In Palestine, you only get about 50 rainy days. So you get all of that rain in a very short period of time. Uh, the majority of that comes in January. And so in January, you get this massive amount of rain and it floods everything. And so if you build your house on a nice flat sandy area, maybe it looks great to build a house on during the dry season, but then the rains come and the floods come and that area floods and it destroys the house. So. In Matthew, I think Jesus was telling this story, it may not be so much about the rock as much as about the location. So you gotta build your house in a location where the floods aren't gonna destroy it, where the storms aren't gonna destroy it. During the wet season, you want that, that rock, that high ground that's rocky, where the floods don't reach it. And there, your house will be solid. Okay, okay, so you are just blowing my mind right now because I had this image that I knew was true of digging down to bedrock and now you're telling me that that's probably not what Jesus was saying in Matthew, that it's really more about the location of where you choose to build your house. That's right. Now in Luke, Jesus tells... Whoa, 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 whoa. We're talking about the parable of the wise and foolish builder. That's in Matthew. Right. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus also tells a story about a wise and foolish builder. But here he talks more about the foundation. In one, in one uh, person, the wise man, he actually dug down to the rock to build his house. The, the foolish man didn't even build a foundation at all. He just started building his house on the shallow surface, on the surface of the sand, where the surface is unstable and the soil is not confined, it's not consolidated. And when the storms come, it washes away the sand. And so the sand house collapsed. I, uh, okay, so uh, I'm really uh, a little confused now that First of all, this parable's in two places, okay? Who knew that? <laughs> Luke and Matthew <laughs> report this parable, and they take two different kind of takes on it. One is about choose the right location, and then Luke says it's not just about location, it's about foundation. It's a, right, it's about the soil strata that you bear on. You gotta bear on something that's solid, that's not gonna wash away when the storms come. Well, there you have it, folks. Thank you, Mark, for joining me out here on the construction site and helping to open our eyes to what Jesus was saying with the parable of the wise and the foolish builder. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Can we build it? Yes, we can. All right. Well, Mark has definitely given me some things to think about. The first thing we need to do, I think, is just look at Luke's version of this parable, compare side to side with Matthew's version. 
So let's look at that right now. Matthew says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Luke's version is very similar. As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on the rock. So there's that one difference Mark was calling attention to. The one guy built his house on the rock, and it may be more about location in Matthew. And, and Luke, he's actually doing the hard work of digging down deep and laying a foundation on, on the rock. Let's go on. In verse 25, The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. In Luke, when a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but it could not shake it because it was well built. And then we get to the fool, the foolish builder, in Matthew verse 26. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And then Luke's version says, But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. So in both Gospels, Building on the rock is the most important thing, right? Matthew seems to say that it's important because where the rock is located as compared to the flat, lying, low, sandy area that's prone to flooding. And in Luke, Jesus stresses the importance of building on a foundation that is firm and, and stable as opposed to just laying a floor down and walls down on the ground especially sandy ground, without pouring any foundation or digging down and, and, and pouring a, f a footing. I went back and I did a lot of study in comparing Matthew's version to Luke's version and how and why they're different. What was Matthew trying to say? What was Luke trying to say? And, you know, I got into the weeds, to be honest, about construction in the first century and how Matthew was a Jew writing to a Jewish audience for people who lived in Jerusalem and, and around Jerusalem and Palestine and how their landscape is different and their building techniques are different from the Greco-Roman world to whom Luke was writing. He was writing, he was Greek and he was writing to, to Roman civilization and how the landscape and the rest of the Roman Empire was different than that of Palestine with different building techniques. And I just was getting, uh, I like that kind of stuff. Actually, I like to dig and find out the differences, but it was getting a little too uh, off subject. So I need to, to reel myself back in. This parable is really, it's really not about construction techniques. And it's not really about landscaping. It is about three things that I think are important to get out of this message. And these three things all start with the letter W. I know that's a preacher technique, and I usually don't like to do the alliteration, but it just came out today, so I'm going to go with it, okay? The three W's I want to talk about are words, wise, and a warning. The first word is words, the words of Jesus. In Matthew, this parable comes as the conclusion to the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And in Luke, it comes at the end of what we call the Sermon on the Plain. In both of those sermons, Jesus is giving his most challenging commands, his most challenging teachings. And this is where we know a lot of the famous phrases and teachings 
of Jesus all over the world, even people who don't follow Jesus. Things like love your enemies. Things like turn the other cheek. Things like do not judge lest you be judged. He tells us to for, if, if we want God to forgive us, then we must forgive other people. He tells us to give and pray and fast in secret. And he says that, you know what? Lusting in your heart is the same thing as committing adultery. That's how bad it is. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted because they follow Jesus. He says, store up your treasures in heaven, not on earth. Don't worry about your life. Jesus said he was the fulfillment of all the Jewish prophets and the Jewish law. The words of Jesus are challenging to all who take them seriously. Jesus says, though, it's not enough just to listen to my words. He starts this parable by saying, it is not enough to reflect on my words, to consider my words. It's not even enough to believe my words. You must put my words into practice, which brings us to the second W, the wise. Wise people, Jesus says, is how he opens up this parable in both Matthew and Luke. Wise people are the ones who hear the words of Jesus and then put them into practice. Fools hear, but do not adhere. Fools hear the words of Jesus, but do not adhere to the words of Jesus. By the way, the Greek word in here for fools is moro, where we get the word moron. Wise people scout the terrain, and they make a conscious, educated decision to build their life on the words of Jesus. And they do this by putting those words into practice. They do what Jesus says. His teachings, his commands, they follow Jesus. This is what the wise do and how they're defined by Jesus as separated from the morons or the fools who only listen but don't put into practice. And I'm afraid that many of our American churches are filled with morons, filled with Foolish people. Now, that may seem sound harsh, but I'm just go with me for a minute, okay? Because I'm trying to track what Jesus is saying here. People who have a faith of cheap grace. People who claim to be Christian because they go to church, because they're members at a certain church. Uh, here's a big one. Because of family his history and family heritage. My family has always been a member of this church. My family has always been this with this denomination and so they think that they have inherited their christian faith uh, foolish christians are those who think just because they go to church they have church membership they have a christian heritage therefore they are christian right or maybe they said a prayer several years ago asking jesus to come to in into their heart but that was a long time ago and they're not following through on it at all. In fact, they look no different than anybody else who says uh, they're not Christians. There's nothing wrong with attending church. There's, it's all good. Church attendance, church membership, having a Christian heritage and a Christian history. Believe me, I'm, I've been graced by that and blessed by God by having a family heritage that is Christian. Those things are good things. It's a good thing to ask God to save you, to pray a saving prayer of faith. These are great things. But if we're not putting the words of Christ into practice, Jesus says, this is not Barry saying it, okay? It's Jesus, so don't get mad at me. Jesus says, the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. So we have the words of Jesus. We have the wise who follow the words of Jesus. And then we have a warning. Now, there are at least two warnings in this passage that I want to bring up. Matthew says, 
that the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house. And Luke says a flood came and that a torrent struck the house. So in these bad weather warnings, there are two faith warnings that you and I need to be aware of. The first one, and this is probably the primary warning that Jesus is giving in this parable, is that the storms and floods represent the coming judgment and the wrath of God. Now, this is, this is not something people want to hear. This is not something people want to talk about, uh, but it's real. And if you read your Bible, you know that the wrath of God and the judgment of God is something that we cannot escape. Jesus is warning his listeners and Luke and Matthew are warning their readers here, as well as all of us today, that one day everybody is going to meet their maker. And we're going to stand in judgment before Almighty God. And Jesus says that the storms will reveal whether we have a true foundation or not. All throughout the Old Testament and in Jewish literature, other, other Jewish writings, as well as descriptions of the end of time in, in Revelation, we see that the language of storms and floods serve as symbols of God's wrath and judgment. Let's take a minute and look at Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 10 through 16. A lot of people think this was the primary source for, for the parable that Jesus tells about the wise and foolish builder. And now the setting here is in Judah, Babylon has already come in and taken a lot of the young men away as prisoners. And Ezekiel is living in the land in Israel, and he's warning people, Babylon is coming again, and uh, we, we, we may be experiencing relative peace right now, and all the prophets, the so-called prophets, are really preaching peace. Everything's okay. We have peace. Peace is going to continue. And Ezekiel is saying that is not true. This is not the word from God. God says there's a coming wrath, a coming judgment by the hands of Babylon still coming. So that's the context in the background of this verse. He says, because they lead people astray saying peace when there is no peace. And because when a flimsy wall is built, they cover it with whitewash. Therefore, tell those who cover it with whitewash that it is going to fall. Rain will come in torrents, and I will send hailstones hurtling down, and violent winds will burst forth. When the wall collapses, will people not ask you, where is the whitewash you covered it with? Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. In my wrath, I will unleash a violent wind. And in my anger, hailstones and torrents of rain will fall with destructive fury. I will tear down the wall you have covered with whitewash and will level it to the ground so that its foundation will be laid bare. When it falls, you will be destroyed in it. And you will know that I am the Lord. So I will pour out my wrath against the wall and against those who covered it with whitewash. I will say to you, the wall is gone and so are those who whitewashed it. Those prophets of Israel who prophesied to Jerusalem and saw visions of peace for her when there was no peace, declares the Sovereign Lord. You can see why a lot of scholars think that this passage from Ezekiel is the primary context that Jesus is drawing on when he gives the parable of the wise and foolish builders. So we have the words of Jesus. We have the wise who obey and practice the words of Jesus, and we have the warnings. The primary warning in this parable is about the future judgment, future wrath of God that's going that we're all going to face. We're all going to stand in judgment one day. And yes, God's wrath is going to be poured out in that process. And you can read about that in Revelation when the angels pour out the different bowls and and God's wrath is shown as lightning and thunderstorms and storms and, and violent earthquakes. But there's another warning that I think Jesus has in mind for all his followers. And that is this, that there are going to be storms in our life 
and that we should expect storms to come. And these storms are going to reveal whether our faith is on a firm foundation or not, whether our faith in the practice of doing the words of Jesus is really there, if that's how we built our life or not. See, life on earth, life on earth is not easy. It was never promised to be easy. Jesus never said that his followers would have an easy life without problems. And I, listen, Christians do a disservice when we paint this picture of to non-Christians that following Jesus is easy. Following Jesus, all your problems are going to go away. That's just not true. It, we need to be careful how we give our testimony when we're talking to non-Christians. Jesus never said that following him is going to be easy, but he does promise to go through the storms with us when they come. And I, here's a verse I've been referring to over the last several weeks. It's John 16, 33. And Jesus told his followers, he said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So Christians should not expect an easy, carefree life, and we should not be surprised or even discouraged when storms hit us, because Jesus told us to expect storms. But there's also that promise that he said, I've told you these things so that in me, in Jesus, you may have peace. So those are our three W's that I pulled out of this parable. The words of Jesus are very challenging. And we need to take them to heart. But it's not good enough just to listen and hear and meditate and reflect on, consider. Those are good things. But the wise person puts those words into practice. And the third W is the warnings. There's going to be a final judgment. And Jesus is warning us. If you want your house to stand, it must be built on Jesus. And, he's also, and the word following Jesus, practicing the words of Jesus... And that's the same scenario. The same thing is true in today when we face storms. In Jesus, we can have peace even in the midst of storms. So in my mind, these two houses side by side uh, look exactly the same from the exterior. They, um, in today's language, they both have the same chimney. They both have the same shingles. They both have the same number of rooms and windows and doors and they may be freshly painted and looking good with attractive colors yards are well kept and the outside they look the same maybe those two people also attend church maybe the same church they sing the same songs they send their children to the same schools but one has been wise and the other one has been foolish. The wise man grounded his house in a safe location and on a firm foundation. Jesus and practicing the words of Jesus, doing the words of Jesus. The foolish man built seemingly an identical building, but short-sightedly he built in a sandy location that's prone to flooding. And he built without a foundation at all. The foundation of one man's life is solid, and that of the other is non-existent. Each house looks secure in good weather. Only storms reveal the quality of the work of the two builders. A wise person represents those who put Jesus' words into practice. Like the people in the parable, they too are building to withstand anything, any storm. Those who pretend to have faith, who have merely an intellectual commitment or enjoy Jesus in small doses, are foolish builders. And when the storms of life come, and they will come, their structures fool no one. Above all, not God. Jesus ends his sermon with a mic drop. If there ever was a mic drop, at the end of a speech, end of a sermon, this is it. He says the foolish person's house collapsed with a great crash and its destruction was complete. Boom! 
drop mic, walk away. That's how the sermon ends. The sermon ends with what has been implicit throughout the whole sermon, the demand for radical submission to the exclusive lordship of Jesus. This is the only sure way to face the storms of life, both now on this earth and in the end of time. At Cordova Community Church, I am part of a builder's club, a wise builder's club. And I'm so thankful that I have wise builders all around me because, to be honest, I don't always want to take the difficult way. I'm interested in taking the easy way. And following Jesus is not easy. It it's, can be difficult. It goes against my flesh and what I want. So I'm really glad I'm surrounded by people who love Jesus and are building strong houses on firm foundation of following Jesus and doing what Jesus said. And we would love to have more people in this Builders Club. Jesus wants more people to join his Builders Club. It starts by surrendering and in humility and saying, God, I really don't know how to build this house. And of course, you're not telling him anything he doesn't already know. But it, it, it talk, starts with that confession. I don't know how to do this. I can't do this on my own. I need God in my life. And maybe it's because the storms have already been slamming up against your house. And you can see the cracks. And you can see the walls starting to crumble. The foundation giving way. And there are signs that you need an expert builder. You need a firm foundation and you need to be part of a wise builders club that's where it starts and look, I want to lead you in a prayer right now and maybe you can confess this to God and allow him to lead you on, on your next steps let's pray God thank you so much for this parable that is so familiar to us it's so easy for us to kind of skip over it and not really look at it in detail thank you God that you are inviting us to join the Wise Builders Club to put our foundations down on the rock of Jesus and His teachings. We want to be wise. We want to be the ones that are in this parable who are doing the things that Jesus said to do. We're obeying your commands. We're listening and we are obeying. We don't want to be like the morons, the foolish people who hear your words, but pay them little regard and go on their own way and do life their own way. Father, I want to thank you for the storms that do hit us and reveal our shoddy workmanship so that we can turn to you and ask you for your help, God. Thank you, God, how you glorify yourself even in the worst times. Now, as followers of Christ, help us not to be surprised or even discouraged when hard times come, but to remember that in these things, in you, we have peace. And we want everybody to experience this peace that comes from only Jesus Christ. So right now, God, help us to humble ourselves, to confess that we need you, and to turn our lives over to you, to surrender our lives to you and come into our life and renew us and give us that strong faith so that we can stand when storms come our way now and we can stand in the judgment before you knowing that we are in Jesus and we are saved. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you are interested in really knowing Jesus more and you really want to know what it means to follow Jesus, to hear Jesus' voice and his words and to put those things into practice, we want to help you do that. So follow the information below, send us an email, give us a phone call, and we will be in touch with you. Thank you. And God bless you.